Hey everyone, I'm Marek from TenWeb and welcome back or welcome for the first time to our YouTube channel. As always, we are going to tackle another important WordPress related issue, but this time it's going to be a little bit different. Our today's guest is a trainer and YouTube content creator, Ron Stefanski from One Hour Professor, who in just seven years was able to generate over $1 million of income thanks to his online businesses. And this is exactly what he is going to share with us as we discuss how to create an efficient blog that generates passive income. This video was brought to you by TenWeb, an automated WordPress platform designed for agencies. Automate hosting, speed optimization, migration, site building and management, and skyrocket your agency growth. Sign up for a 14-day free trial and experience true automation. Hey, Ron, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Hey, Arg, thanks so much for uh, having me. I really appreciate it. I'm actually really looking forward to the uh, conversation here and, and getting to know you and the audience a little bit better. Thank you. So um, our today's uh, topic, so generating passive income has always been very appealing for people. Uh, but last year when COVID kicked in and the economical situation got worse, uh, it also forced many people to look into new sources of passive income and blogging is one of them. So can you, uh, for the starters, just guide through us quickly through the process of creating a blog? Yeah. Um, well, first off, I want to say, I think that uh, I know many people probably don't see it this way, but that influx of people into this environment, I think is a very uh, positive thing. I think a lot of employers are now realizing that remote work is possible. Um, and that gives so many opportunities to people that have been kind of like, you know, putting this off because, you know, it, it's easy to put it off when you have a full time job and you're commuting to and from work, it gets really difficult. So I'm actually excited about that for the industry. But in terms of uh, guiding, you know, getting into the process of creating a, a good blog, it really starts in the beginning. The first thing that people usually ask is, um, you know, what are like the topics that I should focus on, right? And that really is um, an extremely important part of the process is picking a uh, topic or a, yeah, you know, like a main topic, I guess you could say, a niche, if you will, uh, to focus on within your blog. So Really, what I always do is I'll probably get like three to five different ideas. Uh, and I am one of those people that rely on data. Um, it's great to, you know, have conjecture and think, oh, this will happen or this will happen. But none of that really matters uh, if the data doesn't support it. So what I typically do um, is I will come up with, like I said, like three to five topics of ideas try to niche down a little bit. So instead of like creating a, you know, if you're a beginner, um, if you're more advanced, this, you know, you may be able to go more broad, but if you're a beginner, instead of, for example, creating a site on cats, you create a site on a specific breed of cat. Um, something like that is a good example to show, you know, people how you kind of niche down. So I think niching down is really important. And then what, what I'll do uh, with most beginners when I recommend things is, is that they get those three to five topics and then they actually do a, a keyword research deep dive. So they're going to you know, use whatever their preferred keyword research tool is. Um, I use Ahrefs. And then basically you look at data to determine the validity of your niche. So you kind of just look at the overall um, search volume and, and difficulty to understand how feasible is it to actually build uh, a site in, in that particular niche that you're talking about. Um, and then really, I mean, a lot of people like to get fancy here and say, oh yeah, there's all these different things that you got to do, yada, yada. But and the end of the day, I mean, we can go into, I could probably go into a two, three hour long discussion here, but the reality is what it comes down to at that point is after you've nailed down a niche and you kind of have some ideas of uh, topics through your keyword research, at that point you write or you uh, outsource to get uh, content written. And uh, I, you know, I usually would recommend someone do that for like about four to six months pretty consistently. And then I usually, um, I'm an advocate of link building I don't know your thoughts on link building, but I am an advocate. So for the beginners out there, that's having other sites point to your site, uh, finding ways to get other sites to link back to your site. Um, I'm an advocate of doing that at about month five or six and then going right back into the content. Uh, and then really that first year is probably, I'd say probably about 85, 90% of writing or getting uh, content written and maybe 10 or 15% focused on link building and, and kind of marketing the site. So um, thank you for sharing all of that. And actually, uh, since you talked about link building, um, we have an 
article related to that topic in our blog so i will put that down in the description for for all, all those of you guys who are interested to learn more about that and uh, you said that during the first phase you should mostly focus on like creating writing that content and you also said that uh, outsourcing is also a choice um, how much content uh, should the websites produce like should it be two blogs per week one or is it not a I don't know, static number and it depends on the industry. Yeah, I, I think, um, and, and people always want like absolute numbers, right? They're always like, well, how long does my blog post have to be? And how many posts do I have to do a week? And they want those absolute numbers. So as a general rule of thumb, I think it really depends. It, it, that gets deep um, into a rabbit hole because I think it depends on your monetization uh, plan. So if you're really focused on affiliate, um, and I'm not talking about Amazon affiliate, I'm talking about uh, like software affiliate, things like that, um, that could be a little bit more competitive. I don't think, because I'm doing that on my own site, one hour professor right now, that's what I've been focusing on. I don't think in that instance, you necessarily need to create even more than one blog post a week, because in that instance, your content has to be, I mean, it has to be the best out there. It really, really does. Um, but if you're focused on really a business model that I focused on previously, which is display ads um, and making money through advertising, you can actually, you know, get your content created. And a lot of the times you can create content that is really doesn't have much competition. Uh, that's just the reality of it. So the content there, I'm not saying it can be bad, but it doesn't have to be as polished as something that's focused on affiliate marketing, right? So I would say in general, if you're focused on affiliate marketing, um, even Amazon, I mean, my biggest thing is consistency. Uh, I've just found that so many people ask that question and I'm like, well, did you stick to the even one per week? And the answer is no, uh, that happens way too often. So my biggest thing is just focus on consistency. So what I always tell people is, you know, set productivity goals, um, especially in that first year and really focus on that because there's a lot of uh, external variables being mainly being Google that you're not able to really control at all. Uh, none of us can. So I think it's better to set productivity goals. And usually if someone's doing affiliate, I'd probably say one to two um, articles that are really well written per week. Um, if they're focused on a more display uh, ad type of business model, I mean, depending on the topic and how deep this gets, I'd say usually like three to four a week um, in that instance. But again, it's all about being um, you know, consistent with your efforts. That's the biggest thing to go back to is you know, figuring out, okay, I mean, I would say to anybody, anybody that's gonna start a site today, you know, before you even start, first off, commit to it for a year. And then second off, say, okay, how much content do I want written by the end of that year? And then just work backwards. Um, and usually the keyword research, that that's a huge step in the process. And in that process, you're going to uncover a lot of different things that um, you actually want to focus on, you know, and like the keywords that you want to focus on. So and, uh, there are a bunch of websites for free freelancers for finding uh, freelancers and outsourcing your work. Do you think any of those is better for like outsourcing content creation? Yeah, so I found um, Upwork can be kind of hit or miss uh, in terms of writers. Uh, so when we're talking about outsourcing content. I'm, I'm obviously focused 100% here talking about writing specifically. Um, so I found that Upwork can be kind of hit or miss with writers. If you're looking for, if you're going to display ad model and you're really focused on display ads and making money that way, um, I do think that Upwork, you'll probably be able to find someone in the, I don't know, two cents to five cents per one, no way. I should say $2 to $5 per 100 words. Uh, that's probably a better way for me to explain that. So two to $5 per 100 words, I think is realistic on Upwork. Um, and then I would say for me, uh, focusing on like higher end, really, really good content, uh, I typically will use the pro blogger uh, job board. So that's one that I really like. I will say too, um, I always hear people say this and I've actually said this in the past. I'm totally guilty of it. Is that a lot of people recommend, hey, only work with people that are in the United States because they're native English speakers and all that. Um, that's actually a very dumb suggestion. I used to make it myself uh, because I found that there are people in other countries that have studied it even better than myself. And I've also found that there's plenty of people that are where we're in the US, they are digital nomads, they are going elsewhere in the world. And when you only focus on the US people, you completely miss the boat of those people. So um, just be open to hear from people from all different countries because you'd be surprised. Uh, one of my primary writers, for example, right now is in South Africa 
And if I had that closed mind, I never would have tried her out. So I actually got into digital marketing and then into IT through content writing myself as well. And yeah, content yeah, writing yeah. in English. Yeah, there's some smart people out there. You just have to, you know, it's, I, I hate to say it's my ego, but it was kind of like the, you know, oh, US and, and everybody's a native English speaker. Uh, and, and while that is true in the US, that doesn't mean that there's people that aren't good writers elsewhere. So just, just be open, uh, open-minded with that for sure. It's, it's worth being that way. Absolutely. So going back to creating uh, blogs, like, can you guide us how to make web those websites? There are a bunch of tools. Which one do you prefer and which is the easiest way to get started with, with the blog? Yeah. Um, in general, so I'm a big advocate, first off, of uh, WordPress. Obviously, that's probably my biggest thing. Um, I mean, hosting, you know, when, when you're talking about the true beginners here, I actually do recommend Bluehost. Uh, if you have a, a site that it has grown to a certain point and, um, you know, has a decent amount of traffic and things and is, it's worth the cost, uh, at that point, you can migrate off of. But I actually recommend um, Bluehost because what I found was when I recommended other people, it got too complicated. Uh, and, and Bluehost has built up a, um, I guess, a way to really onboard people who have no idea what they're doing, essentially. So, so for the real beginner, right? Like they've really created an onboarding process with that. So I recommend that. Um, in terms of actually creating the site, I mean, you know, without diving into a, a WordPress dashboard and explaining it, uh, that's one thing. But essentially, when you start off a site, you have to find a theme uh, that works for you. So, um, you know, it just depends on what platform you prefer. There are a ton of different platforms out there. Um, you know, there's plenty to choose from. So that's kind of a, a decision for you to make on your own. And then after you have figured out your theme, sorry, my cat is uh, right here as usual. She always jumps on to the calls here. I don't know if you saw her, um, but yeah, anyway, okay. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so choosing a theme and then after you have a theme created, I mean, it's really just about, especially in the beginning, it's about creating like an about page a privacy policy page, terms and conditions, and a contact page. Uh, those four main pages, and then, you know, like a home page, and then just writing. Like, I think this is one of the areas that people get way too stuck in. Uh, they, they, especially the beginners, they think, oh, well, I got to make this perfect site that's absolutely beautiful. And while it is to have a site that looks decent, right, uh, in the beginning, and you should have something that looks decent, um, you know, there's some people that will spend six months trying to create their logo and their domain name, right? So to me, it's like, hey, get that stuff. And, and yeah, there is importance to it. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But in the beginning, what people need to realize is that most people don't even see your site. Like, so if you spend all your time on these things that don't matter, you're never going to actually grow your site uh, because you're not creating content. And if you don't ever create content, you'll never get views. And then most people, five to six months in, they just end up quitting because they get frustrated. And they're like, well, no one ever came. It's like, well, yeah, duh. You know, you spent five months designing everything and making your logo and all this stuff. And it looks great, but uh, you never created content. So no one's ever going to find you. Yeah, it's, it's great that you uh, touched upon WordPress because it was actually going to be my next question. Like, is WordPress uh, suited well for uh, creating blogs even nowadays because it's it's been a while since well, since WordPress was around, um, and I also want to add something to your previous points. So uh, and the importance of speed. Uh, so also uh, like all of those pages, terms and conditions about us. You can guys find a bunch of templates on the internet and then just customize it for your specific blog again to save your time. So um, um, just still talking about the technical aspects uh, of creating the blog, which one of those stages, like selecting a theme or I don't know, finding costing, what, whatever, uh, which one of those stages is the most time consuming one? Um, I would say probably the most time consuming. I mean, the most time consuming one for most people should be, I mean, obviously writing the content would be the most time consuming thing there for anybody. Uh, but I would say most people spend probably more of their time focused on buying the right domain than they should. I think that probably finding the right hosting is actually pretty important because it, like you just mentioned, like website speed and things like that do matter. Uh, but there is just, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult line to walk because so many people are, are such beginners, right? So if you give them any hosting, it doesn't have great customer service they get really confused. Uh, so that's kind of why it's like, you know, uh, that whole process. So I would say in terms of the one that would, that should take 
the most time before creating content without a doubt is the initial research phase, uh, the keyword research, everything I talked about. I spend any time I'm about to start a new site. And I used to launch a new site like every like four months. I was doing that and I built up a portfolio of like, I think it was like 12 sites at one point. And then I was like, this is stupid because I, I couldn't do anything well because I had way too many sites. And I had, I mean, it was growing and things were going good, but it was just getting too much. So I actually have scaled down quite a bit. Um, but I would say that part is the most important because you usually spend, I mean, if you're doing it right, I do what I call like a keyword dump, which is essentially like, I don't know, like I'll spend like one to two working days, maybe even three working days, um, you know, actually doing the keyword research and really determining the right topic before I move forward. Because if you don't do that part right, then, you know, nothing else matters. You're sunk. So the, the choice and the niche and the keyword research is extremely important for sure. Okay. And since you talked about hosting and the importance of onboarding and uh, like good customer support, I'm going to add a little bit of self uh, well promotion here shamelessly and yeah, uh, talk yeah. a little bit about <laughs> TenWeb. And um, actually, we do cover all of those. And our platform is exactly an automated WordPress platform that's suitable for agencies, freelancers, and even beginners because we have a bunch of tools that are completely automated, like image optimization, we have tools for SEO, and we get a 90 plus page speed score uh, for SEO as well, which is, uh, we'll talk about this next, uh, which is very important for the traffic. So uh, my blog is ready. I have the content. How do I bring people to my website? A little bit of patience, a little bit of luck, uh, and a lot of hard work. Uh, that's like the reality of it. So, um, okay, if it, once it's all ready, you know, people are always looking for, okay, well, what's that? What's that gonna like? When does it happen, right? Like, when's that magic bullet? Um, there's always the chance that you could post to social media or utilize social media to drive traffic over, right? You could do that, or you could uh, use Facebook and and run ads to drive traffic over. I personally don't do really any of that. I barely focus on social media. Um, I don't ever use ad advertising. I just don't do it. Um, it's not to say that it's bad. It's just to say my business model, I haven't had to. So typically for the most part, if you're focused on the SEO model, um, which is where my focus is, where you're getting organic traffic from Google and other search engines. Um, like I said, kind of earlier, it's about create, like once you have it all set up, Okay, great. Now consistently create some content for about, I don't know, I'd say like four to six months. And then at that point, what you want to do is a link building campaign uh, of some sort, right? And I'm not talking about going out and finding a link broker and spending a bunch of money on links. What I'm talking about is maybe looking in your industry and trying to find some areas to guest post. And I'm, I'm not talking about a lot of links here. I'm talking about like maybe five to 10 total. Um, and the idea is just to go out there and get some links pointing back to your site you know, I'm talking, like I said, I I'm talking about skyscraper stuff. I'm talking about like guest blogging. Um, there's a lot of different link building tactics out there. I don't recommend like forum posts or comment link building. I don't rec recommend any of that. I'm talking about earned actual links um, that you can get, getting five to 10 of those and then just stopping and going right back into the content and creating the content. Because here's the, as of right now, uh, at this point in 2021, what I have found is that generally speaking, it takes about four to five months uh, to where a site is going to really start to see any love from Google at all. Um, you might see a few things trickling before that, but not much. I feel like at that at four to five month ish area, that's when Google starts to actually recognize you a little bit, uh, a little bit more than previously. And then that's why about a month or two later, I like to hit it with just a few links to kind of show you like, hey, my site's reputable, right? Like this is a real thing, it's going good. And then going right back to the content. Um, I would say if you're able to, to really say, hey, that first year is going to be a slow year and not to expect that you're going to write one blog post and it's going to go over the moon, you're going to make millions of dollars. Uh, if you're able to have patience and understand that this is a long-term game and it does actually work. Uh, I'm, you've probably seen this, uh, Eric, but I've got um, on my own site, I've got the income reports page, right? And it's, it's interesting because like in the beginning, you could see my first few months, I was losing you know, I was investing. I wasn't losing. I was investing money, right? So three, $500 a month. And then even the first year, I think I lost like $1,500 after like four months. And then the next year I made like $8,000 for the year. And then the year after that, like 30,000. And it just progressively um, shows like with my income reports, 
how it climbed up over time. Um, and that really is this type of business. Like, like you said, it took me seven years. I did hit a million dollars actually this year, super excited about it, really recently. Um, but it took me seven years to get there, right? Like it wasn't like this, like, hey, here we go, we're all good. And that was also including selling a big website um, in that figure. So understanding that it's a long-term game uh, in terms of how long it takes, I would say if you do what I'm saying, I'm saying about being productive that whole first year and you, you get everything in and you, you give yourself a year, by the end of that year, my biggest thing I always turn to people, I say, you're going to be in a better position. Something's going to be happening, right? As long as your content isn't terrible, something positive is going to be happening and you're going to have a, a real foundation there to work from, right? So at that year, maybe it's, hey, you keep creating more content or maybe you kind of shift and go into different content or maybe you start building more links. It depends. But the point is, if you can put in that whole year and, and just trust that it's not that uh, glamorous, it's pretty thankless that first year. It's tough. But if you can get over that hump and you're consistent about it, good things will happen for sure. It's great to know that a lot of work pays off if you are doing it well as well. Um, and I know that you have ex previous experience in marketing, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure many of our viewers will also be interested to learn learn more about that. So where do would you recommend uh, people to get that mar digital marketing knowledge, like also about SEO, link building? Uh, do you have any preferred uh, maybe YouTube channels or blogs? Yeah, uh, I mean... Shameless plug my own, of course. Uh, that, so I have my own YouTube. Uh, it's got about 14,000 subscribers. So that's at one hour professor. So that's that's pretty good. Um, there's other ones though, obviously. I'm definitely not the only one out there. So uh, I would say uh, I really like Authority Hackers uh, is a really good one. Um, Authority Hacker is a good one. Um, I'm also a fan of uh, Brian Dean with Backlinko is another pretty good one. Um, Neil Patel... I think some of the stuff is good, but some of it's a little fluff. So it's kind of, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, he caters to the beginners. So it, it's hard to, for me to resonate with him as much because he caters a lot to beginners. Um, so he's another one. And then probably, I would say for now, that's probably the, the top three um, that I would focus on. I, I used to say Pat Flynn with Smart Passive Income, but I feel like he's really deviated his business into other areas at this point. So I don't know that he's really the best for this like specifically on websites anymore. He focuses on online business more generalized, uh, but website related stuff, I would say those, aside from myself, of course, those are probably some uh, other really good ones too. Okay. And uh, actually, since we're uh, already talking about marketing, uh, one question that always comes up to me when I'm thinking of opening my blog uh, is when can I know for sure that my blog is bad? When, should, when do I know I should stop this? Or maybe I chose a wrong niche. Uh, is there a specific time or maybe some statistics that I should analyze to understand that? Yeah, so I would say within probably, I'd say between months six to eight, you should be getting something from Google. You should be getting picked up a little bit from Google. Um, and I say a little bit because that number can vary greatly, right? It depends on what your, what your keyword, keywords you're targeting and their search volume with them. Uh, generally speaking, you're going to start seeing a little bit of love between months six to eight from when you start. That is like, you know, something is going to happen. You're going to start seeing that positive try trend uh, going up and to the right. Um, I will say one thing, because you, you mentioned, hey, well, if I pick the wrong niche. So the best way to pick the wrong niche. So I, sh I should have clarified this in the beginning. So I had talked about, um, about cats, right? Specifically about cats and then niching down to a specific breed of cat, right? I talked about that. Uh, that to me, what I have really focused on uh, in the last, I'd say probably a year and a half, two years, that doesn't mean that my URL uh, is specifically about that breed of cat, right? Like, um, like uh, for instance, a uh, Savannah cat, which is a kind of exotic cat. Um, if, if you create like savannacatblog.com, you're really stuck to Savannah cats. But what I'm saying is, is that with your domain, um, just you can make a generalized domain, right? So I'm going to say cats.com. Of course, that's taken, but you can take a generalized domain, have that, and then focus on the particular breed that you want to focus on. So it's okay to have a broad URL or domain. It's okay to have that, but then focus your content on a silo specifically. 
um, is really what you want to do. That's kind of the whole focus to it. So in terms of, and I don't know if you can hear that in the background. Sorry, my wife is closing up some of the stuff. Uh, uh, we, we can hear it, but it's fine. Your voice is over. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. We're, like I said, we're packing. So there's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, but anyway, so I would say like doing that with a, a uh, cat bug is a good example. And then I would say, generally speaking, you're going to want six to eight months. You're going to want to see some traffic coming in. Uh, and then after you see some of that traffic going in, I think it'd be good. If you think that you picked the wrong niche, I don't know that you picked the wrong niche. It's more or less, maybe you should just change your approach within the niche, right? Um, if you find that you're in month six to eight and you pretty much hate your life and you hate the blog content, you hate everything that you're doing, then yeah, maybe you did pick the wrong niche. And maybe that's something that you should think about. Um, but I also do want to say with this, I'm also a huge fan, if you can uh, support it, of utilizing outsourcing. Uh, I think that one of the biggest things that people get stuck on when it comes to creating a blog is as a business, because I treat these things as a business, not a blog. Um, I look at it as a business is that when you're creating this, these, these platforms, you need to make sure that you're okay with not spending money or wasting money, but investing money into your business. Because, you know, thinking about it in general, Eric, like, like what business out there never got any investing, right? And succeeded. None of them, every single business, like Apple, Amazon, every single one of them got some sort of investing. And it doesn't mean they got an outside round coming in. It means that somebody was putting money into the business to grow it, right? A blog is a business. That's the exact same thing. So I just want to advocate to those that are kind of nervous about it. Don't be afraid to uh, outsource some of your content creation. That will be something that'll save you three, four, five hours at a time. Uh, and then people are like, well, that's not my voice anymore. Well, become the editor behind it, right? And then that's still your voice because you're editing everything, you're posting it, and it's still you putting the finish, finishing touches on it. Um, but yeah, I would say in, in, in general, you know, those are kind of the, the metrics to look for in the beginning. And yeah, I know I went on a little bit of a tangent, but don't be scared of outsourcing. Too many people are scared of that. Uh, and I think it's a huge mistake because if you have the financial means to do it, it'll, it'll really propel your growth. My business really grew the more I outsourced because you're just buying other people's time. That's all you're doing. Um, one thing I've recently noticed in blogs is also adding podcasts to it. So there is the link to the podcast or like the playable button right there mm -hmm. before the blog. Uh, what do you think about it? Um, I think, so here's my thing about that, like adding a podcast to a website. It's hard for me to say, because I'm not in corporate America anymore, right? So, um, you know, I'm not a professional job sitting down all day, every day at my desk. Right. Uh, and I felt like when I was at an employer doing that, it was okay to waste a little bit of time. Uh, so, you know, I like, I would sit there and I would go to a website that had a podcast hosted on their site and I would press play and I would listen to it while I was working. Right. Now that I work for myself, Oh no, there's none of that. Right. Like I don't mess around at all. So I have to really, really concentrate. Um, so I think that there is something warranted for the idea of, we're going to embed it on our site so that people can play it in the background, you know, close down their windows and listen to it while they work. I think that there is a use case of it for that. But generally speaking, I can tell you, I never, ever go to a website to listen to a blog because where do I go? I go to all the different, you know, Apple, like iTunes or not even iTunes, whatever it is, the podcast app, whatever it is, uh, or Spotify, all these different, there's so many different apps now. So I personally think that it's fine to do it that way. But um, I do think that there's, you know, like I said, people listening to it while they're working. And then also there's something to the uh, effect of branding it, right? So people coming to your site and saying, oh, they've had this guest and they've had this guest and maybe they'll start to listen to it. Maybe not. I would say anybody like I haven't personally done that. That's my own uh, personal opinion. So I would say anybody that has it on their site, absolutely spend your time looking at analytics to see if it really makes sense, right? We always try to lead with data. That's my biggest thing. So if people are playing and I'm completely wrong and your brand's different, then by all means do it. Like, don't listen to me. Um, I'm just saying my own personal opinion is that whenever I get a pot, whenever I look at a podcast, I always go on the apps because it's just easier to find it and I can play it while I'm working out and I don't have to leave a website uh, on and open in the background, right? So my personal opinion on the matter. Wouldn't it also like hurt monetization in terms of like people are not looking at the ads, they are not clicking on the affiliate links. Uh, is it also something that they should consider? Yeah, I mean, from a monetization perspective, I mean, that's why it's like, if that's just one tab, right, of your site um, and they're going there, 
they're going there to listen to the podcast anyway. Um, you can always within a podcast, obviously talk about like, oh, in the show notes uh, that, you know, this particular link. Uh, but that's absolutely right. I mean, you're definitely not going to be getting clicks on, on display ads at that point, right? Because they're just looking for the podcast um, and affiliate links in general. Um, they're much harder to get clicked on from a podcast. Like I, that there's a reason why I never did podcasts is because podcasts to me, uh, they don't have much SEO value. Uh, and then it's also really hard to monetize them. Some people do it great and you can, uh, but those are like the outliers, right? So to me, that's why I focused on YouTube and websites because worst case scenario with both of those, you can always just run display ads and make a little bit of advertising revenue in the background. Um, but when you get into podcasting, it gets a little bit murky. So yeah, to your point though, for sure, when you're embedding it, I mean, I think that there's, to me, there's a use case for branding and a little bit of user experience for the minimal amount of people that'll use it. But I, I would be willing to bet that most people that have it on their site, if you actually dove into the analytics, I would be willing to bet that most people aren't even listening there. I, I would think that would seem logical to me. So. Uh, so uh, you mentioned advertising, and I know one of the most popular uh, platforms for getting or for setting up advertising on your website is Google AdSense. Yep. Uh, is that what you recommend people to go with, or maybe you have other preference? Oh, I've got a story about AdSense. Uh, so uh, this is actually an interesting little tangent. Yeah, I, so I in, really uh, want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's ugly. Actually, it's been ugly for a lot of people. Uh, it's a really weird problem that Google is being really quiet about. So um, I believe that this was in 2020, I believe. Yeah, I think it was, it was actually right around when pandemic started um, from the beginning of the year. So for years I had a portfolio of sites uh, and I always was recommending AdSense to everybody, right? Uh, because frankly, it pretty much, aside from ad networks, right? Especially for beginners, because they're not usually allowed to get into ad networks. Um, AdSense does pay the best. Uh, that's typically what's gonna happen. There is media.net, which in certain niches can pay a little bit more, but typically it's going to be Google AdSense. So that's like always the first stop for most people, um, which is fine, right? And when you're first starting out, that's fine to do. But my word of caution to you is don't stay on there too long. Um, as soon as you can switch off, get onto another uh, ad provider of some sort. Um, I personally recommend Ezoic. I'm a big fan of Ezoic. I use them on all my sites. They use artificial intelligence to basically determine the best ad layout on your site. Uh, and they have in my opinion, technology that is above all others uh, in this particular area. So that's why I've stuck with them. And I've seen, I have really seen some great things. Again, you can look at my income reports to see, but because um, I disclose all that. So uh, I've seen great things with them. So I usually recommend that. But the reason why I don't love AdSense is because for years, uh, I, I don't know, it was probably about three to four years, I was making Oh God, I don't even remember. I don't remember the exact numbers. Don't quote me here, but I think it was around 20 to 25,000 a month uh, in ads uh, between all my sites, not just one or you know, two. It was between all sites, majority of it one site, but still a significant amount in others. Um, and in early 2020, I started to notice uh, that I would earn a certain amount a month and then I get my check at the end of the month. And it, it wasn't as much as I thought I was gonna get, right? Like it was off by a few hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, whatever. Um, I actually didn't really notice that. I shouldn't say I noticed that. I didn't notice it until I think it was March or April of 2020. I got a check where I was expecting like, I think it was like 16 or $17,000. And I got half of that, literally half of that. So then I'm like, what is going on? Right. And I'm really confused because it's like, well, I have AdSense, like in the, in the dashboard that they have, they're reporting that I made X amount of hours. Why is it less? So what I came to find out is that what you see in the dashboard on AdSense isn't necessarily true because they have to go through a review period to determine if you have invalid clicks, okay? And people are wondering what are invalid clicks. Some people nefariously will send, you know, they'll, they'll click on their own ads, they'll send traffic to their site, click on ads, and they try to make money that way and they try to scam the system. I personally have never done that, right? Um, and then it was like, okay, well, maybe a competitor uh, had sent all this traffic over and they're trying to click bomb me and, and get me banned from Google AdSense. I looked at my traffic numbers. I looked at my server logs. That wasn't it either. Uh, so I don't know exactly what, I know that there was a policy change in November of 2019 at Google. They were very vague about it, but they had changed their policies with their ads, uh, AdSense a little bit. And basically what had happened was somehow for some reason, uh, my main site at the time, which accounted for like 80% of my revenue, got caught up in all of this. 
Um, I couldn't see an instance in which I was repeating clicks or anything weird was happening, except for the fact that they were just literally taking money. So I figured it out uh, and I did the math. I think that they took like, it was between 30 to $40,000 from me in 2020. Uh, that was the total amount of money that they took from me, which is a disgusting amount of money. Uh, so at that point, um, I was obviously very upset about it. And I was really panicking because the biggest problem with AdSense too, you're just nothing to them. Like anybody that joins is a joke to them. They have account reps for people who probably make millions and millions of dollars with them every year. Uh, anybody, even like me, even at 15, 20,000 a month, they don't care. Um, so I tried to reach out to the support. I couldn't get anything. I couldn't get straight answers. Everything was very broad, generalized, um, not very good. So obviously I don't love AdSense anymore. Uh, what I ended up doing at that point is I, uh, I had some contacts at Ezoic that I had known previously on some stuff that we had worked on. And I said, look, here's my situation. I'm not doing anything shady. I have no idea why this is happening. Can you guys help me? Uh, so I reached out to them and they said, yeah, let us look into it. And they put, uh, they have like click fraud built into their platform. They put it in ever since I joined, I've had absolutely no problems. Um, I haven't made as much admittedly. Um, it has been going up over time, but, um, yeah, I haven't had any problems at all. Uh, so I don't really know exactly what was happening. I feel like the site that I had, maybe it was, there was people clicking on ads, they would go somewhere and, and then go back to my site. Um, a little bit more often than, than AdSense would pr prefer. That's the only thing I could come up with, uh, but I really don't know. So yeah, if you're an absolute beginner, AdSense is fine, right? Like I just told you this whole story. Don't think the AdSense is going to steal your money, you know, right away. Um, but if you're an absolute beginner, it's totally fine. But over time, when you get to 10,000 page views, hop off of AdSense, go over to Ezoic. Um, there's also AdThrive and Mediavine. Those are other platforms that those are like the top three that people recommend hop off and go to those. And I do want to say too, one other thing uh, to point out is that this um, AdSense issue, this invalid click or, or them taking away earnings, uh, I have in, if you go into YouTube and you search about it, you're probably going to find me, right? Because I have my channel and I talk about my whole experience and everything. I'm seeing a lot of people come in, not just for blogs, but also talking about this with YouTube and their YouTube channels. I don't know what to deal with, with YouTube channels. Like I, I can't even give advice because I haven't experienced it personally. And I don't know how to handle that, but um similar issue there. So I don't know what's going on at AdSense. I don't know what, what, um, you know, policies they have in place, but it is some very weird stuff. And their excuse is always, Hey, we're not going to tell you too much because we have to protect our advertisers, which makes sense. But, um, it's pretty weird to me. The whole thing is very strange. It's a very black box and you can't really get a good answer. So I don't know. I, yeah. AdSense is fine in the beginning, but get off of it as soon as you can. It, it's sad to hear that these kinds of things happen because of probably technical issues mm -hmm. and people lose a lot of money because of that. So uh, we talked about Google AdSense and we also briefly touched before about on affiliate marketing. Uh, how do you find those affiliates or do they find you? How's the whole process? Um, so when you're starting off, um... I will say when you're, when you're starting off in the beginning, like uh, if you can try to focus a little bit on affiliate marketing in the fir at first, because uh, you're, you're more likely, I feel like to make a little bit of money that way. Ads usually at about 10,000 page views is when, it, when you should focus on it. I have to say that tangent really quick. So people know um, affiliate marketing is nice because you can make money right away, right? You just have to refer people over. Um, in terms of finding affiliates in the beginning. So in the beginning, for sure, uh, I was just finding affiliates and you know, you ask, well, how do you do that? I, honestly, it's the simplest thing ever. I go into Google, I type the brand name and then I just type affiliate program. Uh, that's really the simplest way to do it. There are affiliate, full affiliate network, share a sale, commission junction, all these other ones out there. Um, and they have a bunch of affiliates in there too. So if you don't really know of brands, it may be worth, you know, going into there and searching a particular keyword or topic to find new affiliates to plug into your, your site, you know, that you're building. Um, but Generally speaking, in the beginning, uh, I, I usually try to recommend products that I know, right, that I've worked with and I'm familiar with, uh, because I feel like that's more authentic too. So I like to do that myself. Uh, and that's just a simple Google search. What has happened over time is now I definitely get approached a lot more than I did in the past uh, of people saying, hey, saw your site, love what you're doing. Will you add our, you know, add our affiliate or add our a link to us for our affiliate program? And, you know, there's a whole negotiation that goes there because it's like, well, 
that's great, but no, I'm not just going to send sales your way. So you're going to do it for me. So um, there's a whole negotiation that goes into that, but yeah, in the beginning, uh, definitely finding it myself, uh, mostly through Google because I'm familiar with the space, but if you're not share a sale commission junction uh, you know, and look, there's like fashion for instance, has a, um, a affiliate platform called reward style, which my wife has, I can say this, my wife has a fashion website. So she uses that one. So look in your niche, your, your area, and see if there's any other um, like niche uh, affiliate networks. And if not, then yeah, just go on and Google just the old fashioned way works fine with me. And you can also too, if, you, if you're curious, you can just go on like search like best affiliate programs on Google. You'll get a ton of different results for that too. Are there any other monetization methods for blogs except uh, affiliate and advertising? Yeah, um, definitely. So affiliate and, and uh, affiliate and advertising are, um, well, I'd say advertising and display ads is the simplest one. I'd say affiliate is probably the next level. So there's Amazon affiliate, which is the next level of that, which is also very easy. And then there's affiliate when you're getting into uh, more specific, you know, talking about, um, you know, hosting platform, different software services, uh, products, all that. You get a little bit deeper. Uh, so that's a little bit more competitive. And then uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do in terms of making money on a blog. You can uh, obviously offer consulting uh, and do that. You can offer a like prepackaged service. So you could maybe write about social media, for example, and then say, hey, if you're interested, you can join my community and uh, you know, for 500 bucks a month, I'll give you this prepackaged deal, right? So you can kind of sell your own service in that way. Uh, you can obviously sell software. Uh, some people are, you know, they have great blogs and then they transition into selling software or, or buying a software product. For example, Neil Patel, um, he did this himself. Uh, he had his blog for years uh, and then he ended up, what was the name? What's it? Do you remember the name of the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the platform that he purchased. Hold on a second. It's going to take me a second. Uh, he ended up purchasing a, 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 basically a keyword research platform. Um, and now I'm going, I'm totally yeah, Nail, Nail Patel got Uber suggest. Um, yeah. Uber suggest that's what yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, so Uber suggest was a free platform, right? He ended up going out purchasing it. Uh, he said it was going to be free forever. He adjusted on that. Now he's actually making money. Right. And he's doing a software as a service on his blog, which I'm sure is very lucrative. The guy is smart. He knows what he's doing. Uh, so you can do software. Uh, you can also do courses. Uh, I'm a big fan of courses. That's a huge one as well. Uh, you can make a ton of money there with, with courses, training. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can even, you know, like you can use, um, like one of the things that I always talk about too, is people will create uh, reviews and roundups and things. So, so people who are using um, Amazon, for example, they may have a cat blog talking about the best uh, cat litter boxes, right? I'm just, obviously, I, I don't know why we keep going back to cats here, but we'll just keep doing it. Um, uh, <laughs> Maybe so because there is one next to Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's why, because she literally bit me on the finger before I started. So it kind of just, you know, it still hurts. Yeah. It's bringing it in my head. Uh, but uh, yeah, so like you have like best cat litter boxes, right? And, and people have those, those posts built out. One of the things that you can do is you can actually do drop shipping. So most people will build out a site and then focus on Amazon affiliate and they'll do that and they'll stop. Well, no, you shouldn't stop. What you can do is now you can go to the manufacturer who creates that particular um, you know, litter box and see if they can offer drop shipping, which means that you basically, they, you send them to their website, probably a Shopify site, and then they'll end up uh, purchasing from there. And then, you know, you can make money that way, or you can just put an order on your site directly uh, and then they'll fulfill the order. Or if you want to take it even a step further, because this is going really deep down the rabbit hole, you can actually create your own litter box and then make sure it's good, right? Make sure you're not creating junk, but you can also put that at the top of your list. If it's ranked well in Amazon too, and it looks like it's actually a good product, um, you can do that as well. And then I was able to do this one once in my life. It was really cool. I called it the uh, search engine monopoly. I ranked number one in uh, Google for a particular, uh, I'll actually tell you, it's, it's Bengal cat. It was Bengal cat. So Bengal cat calendar. I ranked number one in Google and number one on Amazon. So that was like a whole search engine monopoly, which was a, such a random product. Uh, and it's a really long explanation as to how I got there. Uh, but you can find that uh, if you're able to monopolize those two search engines, you get a lot of sales at all times. Uh, it just doesn't end. So. Um, so yeah, thanks for telling us all the different methods that you used for monetizing with a blog or they exist in the world. Yeah. And, I'll, uh, I'll say too, not to interrupt you, there's more, right? Like we'll, we'll stop there, <laughs> but you can talk about adding podcasts. I mean, adding YouTube, there's so many things you could do with a blog. 
I'll just stop there. But those are the primary ways that I usually talk about. So. Uh, and uh, since the very beginning, we've been talking about things that uh, people should do to optimize their blogs. Uh, and to kind of sum up everything, what are some of the biggest mistakes that people should avoid doing? The, the most common mistake, um, without a doubt, is what I had already touched on, and that is I'm going to create the best domain ever. I'm going to get the best looking website ever. I'm going to spend $5,000 making a beautiful website. I'm going to get an amazing logo. I'm going to hire a graphic designer. I'm going to do all these things, um, spending months in doing this and then getting there and having a very polished product that has nothing on it, right? The most common problem I see is that bloggers that do that. Um, that's the number one problem is just focusing on the wrong things. So again, keep it simple. Let's just focus on the content, right? Get something up that looks okay with the blog, focus on the content. You'll thank me later. Uh, that would be the number one thing. Number two is that people, I see some people talking about, you know, let's never do backlinking. Um, and, and, and frankly, you know, I'll admit that can work, okay? If you don't ever do backlinking, <clears throat> it is possible for your site within the next three to four years <laughs> to start to get some traffic and do decent uh, in the search engine. Uh, but I'm a big fan of not in a negative way or, or buying all these links and doing these things, but I'm a big fan of building backlinks because of the simple reason that it is giving Google a, a vote of confidence for your site. Uh, so I recommend that people do some backlinking, not a crazy amount, just do a little bit in the beginning, like I said, um, do a little bit of that and make sure you do and then go right back into the content. So I would say not doing link building is another one. Uh, and probably the third one is that, um, and I don't, I don't fully understand this one, but a lot of people are like, I don't know, maybe they're just making excuses. A lot of people are scared to start. Uh, they're very nervous about failing. They're very scared of the whole mental, like the whole idea of like, well, I might spend three, six, you know, six months, a year or whatever into this and I don't get any payoff from it. Right. That's what some people think. And it's like, okay, so that is a huge mistake, obviously, because if you paralyze yourself and you self-doubt yourself so much, you'll never even start. Um, and then if you do start, once you hit a roadblock, you're going to stop. So my thing to that is, and this is why I talk about consist consistency like I did earlier uh, and having productivity goals, focus on that and do it because at the end of the day, the worst thing is it's, it's not about just creating a blog for yourself. Um, you know, you, and you got to think you could potentially be helping a community of people, but in addition to that, um, and you don't even have to share it publicly if you don't want to right away, but you're really just making yourself more marketable as an employee. You're doing things, you know, let, let's turn this on its head for a second and say, okay, well, you, you don't end up, it doesn't go incredibly well. Uh, what ends up happening here? Well, you've learned a whole set, a new set of skills. You've learned how to run your own business. You've learned how to outsource other people, uh, and outsource with people like outsource the labor, manage them. And then you're able to then, if you want to make your blog public, you can then make it public uh, you know, and talk about it a little bit more on your resume and it may end up leading to a better job. Or maybe you'll just find that you really enjoy building a blog and really enjoy creating traffic. Like for example, as a story for me, when I first started out, the first site I ever had was Unemployment Underground. Um, I don't even own the old domain anymore. It was terrible. It was, it was actually really funny. It was in 2008 when the housing crash happened in the US. I created a blog to help people get a job but I created it when I was unemployed myself because I couldn't get a job. <laughs> so it's like that stupid, you know, when you're a beginner, right? It's a beginner's fallacy. Like, I'm going to help people do this. It's like, well, have you done it? Well, no, but I'm going to help people to, you know, so it's like this whole thing. So I actually created it, um, you know, in the beginning and I was unemployed. But the point to that is that you find that when you do that, like I found that when I did that, I created the content. I was like, cool, I have it up. And I was like, oh, I have to get traffic to my blog. How do I do that? And then I really got into the whole, Oh, that's cool. Well, how do I get website trip? Oh, what's SEO? And I learned more about it. And I actually really, really, really liked it um, a lot. So you may end up totally switching your career path. That's end up, what ended up happening to me. I was in sales for seven years and then I was unemployed for like eight months. I created a site, had no idea how to get people there. And then I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then you start to learn more. So I don't know, like, don't be scared. Just, just go forward with it. Um, you know, don't make that mistake that a lot of people do and don't quit too early. Like I said, anything you start, give it a full year, commit to a full year, because too many people, there's so many people that I feel like, and I've had so many friends that have approached me and, and they bought a, a URL and then they just don't do the work or they don't follow up. 
if people just did this and trusted the process and knew that there was a light at the end of the tunnel and that if they're working hard, it will pay off because it does, there, there would be so many more people working for themselves. Like it really is true. It does work. You just have to have the willingness to put in the effort and the um, determination to keep going with it. So yeah, don't be, don't be scared. Just go forward with it. Thank you for uh, your answer and kind of also the motivation uh, for everyone to keep doing it, to try their best at receiving for receiving the best results. Um, that the last part was actually really inspiring. And yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to be like that motivational rah rah guy, but I like I said, I just see, I see it so much that people, you know, they go to that three to five months, they don't have their productivity goals in place. They're not taking it serious. They're thinking of it as a waste of time and they stop and then they go back to their work. And, and people think it's really crazy because um, not to keep harping on this, but they think it's really crazy because they're like, well, I don't want to sit there and, and work on this for a whole year or two years and maybe never see results. Well, first off, if you're doing it the right way and you're working hard and creating good content, you're going to see something. I don't know what that something is, but you'll see something. Hopefully it's a runaway hit. If it's not, at least you'll learn a lot and you'll know how to move forward. Uh, so people think that's crazy yet they would rather go three to five months, get discouraged, stop, and then go work at a job for 30 years that they hate. I, I it just, it's mind boggling to me. Um, and it just kills me when I see that it actually frustrates me and, and it upsets me. because it's like, you, you deserve more. You can do more. You just have to trust it. So yeah, that's enough. My rah rah speech. Sorry. Yeah, I, I really hope that thanks to your, uh, into this interview on all the knowledge that you just shared, more people will, get to that point where they will be able to generate enough passive income to be happy with their life to do what they love to do uh, and at the same time be able to self-sustain um, and yeah. mul keep multiplying their blocks <laughs> yeah and, and i mean the whole thing is too like I, i tell people like hey you know maybe i can be the guy that helps inspire you to be able to take your family to dinner once a month you know they make an extra 100 150 bucks it's like Well, that's cool. Like I had a friend that, that had a blog. It wasn't doing much for like six, seven months. And then we just threw AdSense on it and he made like, like 20 or $30 in his first month. And he's like, wow, it actually works. I'm like, yeah, dummy. I've been telling you it's going to work. Just trust me and trust the process. So yeah, I, I mean, it starts small, right? Like everyone's got to understand it. You're not going to pay your mortgage off overnight, but I have plenty of people that I've worked with uh, and helped out that they ended up, they trusted the process. They did the work. That's the key to the whole thing. They did the work and it does work. And it does pay off. You just got to trust the process. Um, so uh, one more time, thank you for joining us. And uh, to, to end the interview, there is one small thing that we usually do, which is blitz questions. Um, so yeah, let's start with I'll the first I'll try one. to be fast. I'll try to be fast. I'm a, I'm a rambler. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, what do you think? Will robots make our lives easier or they will overtake us? I love this the Terminator, one. This one the is Terminator not movies. So yeah, I love the Terminator movies, but uh, I'm going to say that they're going to make our lives easier. And I think that we'll have a handle on it. I think so personally. Um, what do you prefer, office life or remote? Oh, remote a million times over. I couldn't yeah. ever deal with the, the commuting. That was my, the bane of my existence. Couldn't stand it. Uh, blogging versus podcasting as a way of getting new information. Of a way of getting new information? That's a yes. really good question. I actually would say podcasting because I like to uh, work out every day and it's hard for me to sit down and read as much as it is to just listen to my ears while I'm doing a workout. Cool. Uh, dark mode or light mode? Um, light mode. I'm pretty indifferent on that one. I don't really care. Okay. And finally, which one is the best YouTube channel for learning more about generating passive income? I mean... We all know the answer to this, right? <laughs> One hour professor, obviously. Uh, but really, I do focus a lot on it. I got I to gotta give myself a plug and I'm going to be, my, like we talked about before this, my wife and I were moving from Illinois. This is a long-winded question or a long-winded answer, sorry. We're moving from Illinois to Nevada. We're in the process. Uh, by the time that this airs, I'm sure that we'll be there. And I'm really going to hit uh, YouTube very hard. Uh, so I'm going to say for passive income, especially, I actually talk quite a bit about it. So yes, I will say my own, I will say my own channel for sure. And yeah, there's some others out there, but I'll say my own.
Thank you so much. It was really nice having you here. I really enjoyed the interview and everything you said was on point and very practical to implement. So guys, don't forget to follow One Hour Professor for more insights on generating passive income and blogging. And also don't forget to follow Tenweb's channel for more interviews about WordPress. Um, thank you so much for listening to this interview and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. This video was brought to you by Tenweb, an automated WordPress platform designed for agencies. Automate hosting, speed optimization, migration, site building and management, and skyrocket your agency growth. Sign up for a 14-day free trial and experience true automation.